This is Reverberations, a podcast from New Amsterdam Records. My name is Majel Connery, and in this podcast, I'm going to guide a series of conversations with some of New Amsterdam's artists, marking the release of new albums and delving into their creative process. This episode is about The Beholder, an album by Claire Dixon. Claire is a vocalist, a composer, and producer based in Brooklyn. And as you'll hear, Claire uses lots of different approaches in her music from jazz and improv to ambient music and art pop. Her previous album, Starland, was praised by VJ Iyer as spectacular and featured in Downbeat and on WNYC New Sounds. We're going to dive right in and talk about The Beholder, what this title means to Claire and what it means in the context of her music. Okay, so let's talk about The Beholder. Can you say a little bit more about what this means to you and why is it important to you that we know that that is what this album represents? The Beholder felt like something that I had known existed for a long time that I had never articulated. Just be, I think it was like being in a relationship where I, I was feeling it to more of an extreme. I was, you know, ending up back in this same place that I had been before, and it felt familiar, although very strong in that moment. I think the maybe the point of the beholder, though, is that it's it goes in one direction. The beholder is sort of just giving their attention boundlessly. I put a boundary far away. Because I am writing more about something like emotional experiences that were vulnerable for me and I'm being more vulnerable and I'm telling you like who I am very directly like in the single when I say I put a boundary far away I need the space to throw my desire that's like (laughs) really just very a very honest statement um, that feel, I feel like defines me. And so that vulnerability to me makes it more intimate, but yeah, intimacy is, is, a yeah, it has different, I guess, angles. Well, it's in the eye of the beholder. (laughs) It's in the eye of the beholder, certainly. Of all the pieces you'd like to talk about, you said in the night, Um, and you said that it for you was an embodied, emergent, and through composed song. And I would like to know, (laughs) what does it mean that in the night is embodied? What does it mean that it is emergent? I get, I get what you mean by through composed. You don't, (laughs) you don't have to dwell on that too much, but tell me about the embodiment and the emergence. What, what does that actually mean musically? Yes. Um, So I've started using these words a lot to think about my songwriting. I actually mean them like pretty close to what the definitions are that you would just assume. Like embodiment is um, the experience of being in a body. And um, relating to this song, the way that it came... The, the way that it happened, the songwriting pro- process happened, was um, during this residency, 
in Italy where I was staying in um, this like old church um, and there was an amazing thunderstorm <laughs> that I recorded. Um, there was, I was taking a lot of walks in the surrounding hills and I was recording a lot of the forest. Um, and so to me, that was like the start of the songwriting process, which was very embodied and it was had to do with being in a place and hearing something and being really activated by it and wanting to capture it. And then I uploaded those samples onto my computer or those recordings and started playing around with them. Actually, one of the first components of the song was the when the percussion is, when the arrangement becomes more dense, you can sort of hear like, birds and maybe like water, but they're sort of percussive. That was one of the first pieces of the song that emerged. And I guess this is where emergence comes in. Um, emergence is sort of the coalescing of smaller moments of intention into a broader system of ideas. So when I'm really narrowly focused on how these um, bird rain <laughs> sounds are like creating this percussive sonic space, the idea is that other sort of intentions are emerging from that that are eventually going to create a whole song. And so I'm listening to that and then I'm thinking, oh, what? where does this go? And then it's, it's very moment to moment focused on these small moments and then ending up with a song. <laughs> Like my two cents with this song, which is like has nothing to do with what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like some of your best melodic moments on the album are all packed into this like first two minutes of this song. Like they're rhythmic, they're a little poppy. Like, I and I wondered, I wonder if you are ever tempted to write a straight up pop song. <laughs> or if you feel like you are content to have these kind of like inspirational moments where you're like, wow, that was really cool. Now I'm going to dispense with that and move forward into some other <laughs> territory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that you think this because this is the last song that I wrote on the album. Um, it's the most recent song, I guess. And I think it is the most indicative of the direction I'm going in now. Um, I, I've been affectionately referring, privately until now, referring to the music that I'm making right now as princess music. Whoa, <laughs> um, what does that mean? <laughs> it's, I, it basically just means that I'm making pop music. Oh. Um, but it's still, or, yeah, I guess it, it has this sparkly, glittery quality to it. <clears throat> and I think maybe that's, connected to what you're saying about the melodic lines. If I take your hand And it isn't there And the air is stale And the vacuum holds Bringing us back again To the human way 
Let me ask you another question. Um, there's a moment in track nine, Talons, mm-hmm. um, where the lyric, I want you, sort of begins this different feeling that's like Dirty Projectors meets the, a band that I'm sure you've never heard of called Pattern is Movement. But it's basically you're multi-tracking yourself in harmony. And um, it's awesome. Like it's unapologetically delicious for like a second. And then <laughs> and then it sort of vanishes. I think with this project specifically, I I was really going for this emergent style where I yeah I was moving through ideas um, and maybe being less patient with them <laughs> um, or or just all of them were launching pads, all of them were transitions. It's very much about the the lyric and the momentum I'm saying, I want you to make, and then X, Y, Z, blah, 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 which is sort of this new line of thought. And so the making is the, is the transition. I don't know. It's like walking into a room where everything, there's no repetition. Like there are just a bunch of like little objects that are very unique all together. And I think there's a satisfaction in that. And Especially when I was making this album, I was just so excited by um, creating these sort of microcosmic sort of sonic events, um, like in Thrill of Still. There are a lot of those where it's like just ebbs and flows and sort of like transitions in the middle. Um, and I love making an overall texture of just transition. for you between performance and composition I have a feeling that they are interlinked but but how interlinked are they Mm. oh that's such a good question I haven't used the word performance as much as improvisation when talking about this but composition for me is very connected to improvisation and being in the moment with uh with sound, with embodiment, with um, whatever material the moment offers. And I compose, I guess, by sifting through that material and sort of allowing it to coalesce into um, compositions, into ideas, sonic ideas that are, have like a, a clarity and feel right feel right Mm -hmm. yeah we'll go with that (laughs) Um, and performance is sort of like in parallel to that so I'm sort of improvising and sifting through these ideas but then I'm also responding to what I have on the paper already and making a decision to um to perform them to 
enact them into composition. So maybe performance for me is like that turning point where an improvised moment becomes a composed moment. Right. So if we were going to draw a diagram of your mm-hmm. process that was super, <laughs> super rough, mm-hmm. we would write improv, arrow, composition, arrow, performance, which is to say a lot of your material begins in a moment that is spontaneous and then you collect moments and sift through them in some sort of maybe recorded process, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. And then you consolidate the ideas and kind of push them around and order them. And then once you have an ordered composition with or without sheet music, I'm not sure. (laughs) Then from there you are like, okay, now how, how do I get this on a stage? Is that, is that about accurate? I think you're, you're close. Okay. Redraw redraw the diagram. (laughs) I would redraw the diagram actually to have performance and, composition right next to each other because I think performance isn't just something that like happens on a stage in front of an audience when I'm performing for the recording for my album you know I'm just sitting in my room and I think performance can also be more of a like a headspace a a point where you're making a decision so when I have, you're right, I, I sort of like collect these, this sonic material and then part of sifting through them and making them into compositions is performing them um, and deciding, okay, I'm going to sing this line for this part of the song instead of like the something else. Um, and that sort of decision making is where like, maybe performance and composition overlap for me. And since I'm not writing sheet music down initially, the only record of it is the performance. And so then the performance does become the composition. Do you ever feel clear like you end up with, um, a colleague of mine calls it demo love, where there's like (laughs) this like ineffable moment in uh, an improvisation that you are like, this is gold, but you can't ever recapture it. Like there's just something about the plugin that you were using and how it interacted with your mood that day. And it ends Mm -hmm. up with this like lovely artifact that is impossible to repackage in the form of um, like finished product. Yes. It's so funny. I was talking with someone last night about demos I don't even think about demos like none of what I'm doing to me is a demo it's all up for grabs as part of the finished product which is just I think I I love like I like the sound of demos and um you know maybe some people would say that my music is like a little rough around the edges for that reason um I'm not even in a demo process or like that sort of hypothetical space. I, I like to, to do it as one, one process. So you you sometimes do this vocalese like thing that is wordless and that repeats in a pattern. Um, you do it on tracks four and five. I think those are probably the best examples. Um, I what- I think maybe I know maybe the second half of you don't stop with the guitar. So this little da 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 da. Like the 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 topmost voice in that texture. Mm-hmm. Right. So that is, yeah. It's interesting also with what we're talking about because I'm working in a DAW where you have the. You can just loop a sample. You can basically. just loop a sample, right? Yeah. So 
which I usually don't do, like, but <laughs> I guess when I do, I pick, like, really good. Moments. It's like this kind of little willowy descending line, um, but because you repeat it over and over, it, it starts to have a bigger identity than it would otherwise. Yeah, I guess I, maybe I was I was thinking about that more as like a one of those acoustic or more like referential to Starland moments where it was more about the liveness and of like improvising around that sample um, and doing that like sort of vocal chorus line around the sample, sort of drawing on like my jazz background to be like, these are the changes and this is my solo and I'm building off of this motif. And what about in the night? I feel like I know what you're talking about with that one. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, um, at the end, in between the I'm not the same person as before I'm not the same person as before I entered the dream I'm not the same person day. 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 It's like this crazy, like, broken madrigal in the, in the- <laughs> of the song I really I was listening to that's crazy because I was listening to so many madrigals when I was writing that song (laughs) honestly honestly that's probably where it came from that is funny I was only listening to like just Waldo when I was writing that (laughs) (laughs) I think that you derive power vocally when rather than you creating a world of just solo you you create a field of you yeah i think that like overdubs and embedding myself more in the uh arrangement of the song is uh one of my ways of trying to forefront the production as part of the composition instead of an accompaniment like the counterpoint that's happening in the Production to me is very like important and expressive, equally so to the melody. Is there anything about the music that you would have liked me to ask that I didn't that you really want people listening to this podcast to to get about you? Even though there aren't that many other people playing on the album, I feel like this album is very much a product of me being in community with musicians in New York and especially the improvising um, and experimental music communities here. Um, And the album really wouldn't have been possible or it wouldn't have sounded like it sounds without my going to their shows and playing sessions with them. So I guess I just really want people to know that this album is very connected to those relationships and being in that community, even though it might not be obvious from the credit list or anything like that. Thank you so much for talking to me, Clara. That was super fun. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I really appreciate it. Claire Dixon's album, The Beholder, drops on March 22nd, and you can find it by searching on Bandcamp. You can also go to newamrecords.com for more information about this album and other recent and upcoming releases. The next episode of Reverberations will be a conversation with Alex Sop about her new album, The Hem and the Haw. You can find Reverberations pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. And if you feel so moved, please follow us and leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Majel Connery, and I will talk to you again next time.